Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me today are co-host Tom McGarry, painter, teaching artist, and STEM advocate, and judgment chair of our annual children's competition, Judy Kraskowski, and ASL interpreter, Jay. Judy is an innovative teaching artist, photographer, designer, and writer who enjoys making stuff, helping others make stuff, and talking about making stuff, and then making more stuff. As creators of our civilization, it is our duty to make our mark on future observations. The latest stuff she's making includes fabric design from her artist home in Ocean Boulevard Studios in Southern New Hampshire. Her work is play that is highly influenced by Drawn, her family, which I'll explain in a minute. Judy has said, life is short. What you need to do? Move and joyfully forward. Okay, so tell us now what Drawn is. Drawn? Drawn is an acronym for my children and their significant others. So B, Drew, R, Ross, A, Aubin, Drew's wife, W, Whitney, Nick's wife, and N, Nick. So I include their initials. I've always included D and an R in all of my own artwork. And as other people were permanently added to the mix, we just tried to figure out what would work for this now. And drawn seems to be the best solution. So there it is. So how do they influence you? You said they influence all your art. Is it? Oh my goodness. Um, we are a very creative family, the Krasowskis. We do, uh, let's see, my youngest son is the banquet chef at the Foundry in Manchester, New Hampshire. Wow. He's cooked since he could first reach up into the freezer and start to store things. So that's, that's always been a good commodity. He's a good commodity to have around the house. Um, my son, Nick, is an editor, a film editor, um, art director, writer, filmmaker himself. Um, he's done that since maybe eight years old when my brother and sister-in-law put a camera in his hands and my dad put a camera in his hands and he's been very busy at that ever since. Uh, my son Drew is a film composer and film scorer and composer, um, also does sound editing. So right now he's the lead senior nick works with a company called team liquid that deals with video gaming and film oh. work and all that drew um works for a company called visual concepts he's the senior lead um sound engineer for them so if you know about foley work and sound effects and enhancing all the sounds that we hear in addition to writing music that Kind of, kind of hard to imagine some of the films that we have today or some of the work that we have today without that music, those extra sounds in there. That's what he does. Um, wow. His wife, Aubin, is an actress. They live in Brooklyn, and she is the dinner detective in, I believe it's the Tribeca area of New York. So you people can see her at dinner theater um, on season. Whitney works for the state of Washington Department of Transportation. Um, she's an architect and civil engineer. So we've got, it's it's just, there's always something oh, that somebody is working on and wow. it's really fun. It's good to wake up and play every day. It's what artists do. Wow. I mean, there's such diversity in the different arts that you have. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we like it. <laughs> Do. Do. that's really neat and actually that goes along with stem or actually now they're saying steam right i knew what stem was well so it's been it's been steam for quite a while it all depends on which I just framework, framework or which point of reference you have <laughs> um engineers tend to think of the imaginative part of their work as being like indigenous to what they do however when people are brand new in the field Sometimes there's training of imagination. There's that visual communication that has to happen. And by putting art into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, right? By putting art into that, you ensure that that 
creative bend is going to continue. The innovative work, the brainstorming, the launch pad stuff, all of that kind of helps things along and, you know, enhances the look, enhances the design sure. of what engineers make because they make all the stuff that we use every day. Yeah. So yeah. Why not have it look good or have it be um, accessible, you know? all that neat stuff that happens. So that's what steam does is puts a little extra oomph into what we use every day. Right. And creativity we use in everything. We don't always think about it, but even, I mean, think of all the creativity for us to be able to talk to each other right now mm -hmm. on Zoom and the people who are listening to this. It's a lot of creativity and a lot of endeavors to get there. That's true. That's very true. Well, let's get back to you, Judy. Here's one of your beautiful paintings. Can you talk about this? Oh, Ooh, you know what? This is not a painting. This is a photograph. I'm One sorry. of the things that I do, I walk a lot out along our little New Hampshire seacoast. Um, we do have one of the most beautiful seacoast areas ever. Um, it's not very long. It's, what is it? 21 miles long, 23 miles long, but the diversity along the seacoast, you'll see rocky areas like this. You'll see um, some very smooth, you know, when the tide goes out, it goes out like a good half mile in some places, just beautiful, beautiful areas. And, you know, with our climate ha in the middle of changing, whatever it's going to change to, we've been getting spectacular sunrises and sunsets. Oh yeah. So this is a shot of the Hampton Beach State Park Reservation, which is right on the border of New Hampshire going into Northern Massachusetts. And this is after one of our latest hurricanes. So it the thing I'm looking at right now, it's, it's a little light, but it's really, the colors are really quite there. And there's a little green in the log down there and all that. Um, I like to pay attention to what it is that you see. So one of the best times of being out along any beach, I think, is definitely off season when um, tourists and the busyness of tourists kind of fades away to the folks who would normally be out there any time of year walking or people will bring their dogs out to the beach when it's off season, horses out to the beach. Yeah. Um, it's really quite spectacular. So, yeah, it's fun. It's, it's a fun cool. thing to to have the convenience of your your cell phone with you. <laughs> you took that with your cell phone. Yeah, and it's that beautiful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Thank you, iPhone. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Apple. <laughs> but there's also such balance in the picture as well. I've been told that people can tell what I do by the offset of angle that I tend to use what's called a rule of thirds compositionally. So things show up at the left or they show up at the right and that there would be angles. Another photographer friend, um, Judy Howard, Judy, I believe it's Judy Joyce Howard from out of Salem, New Hampshire has said that. So it's kind of nice to have a style when I wasn't really thinking about it, <laughs> but that's, that's good. Always well, and that's it seems to be incorporated in this as well. Well, this is a portrait. There is a project that comes from out of the University of Wisconsin area. I hope I'm that's still correct. Um, originated by a man named Ben Schumacher or Schumacher. Uh, he recognized the fact that children all over the world um, have lives. Some of us have stuff, some kids have stuff, some kids don't. One of the things that helps them to retain memories of their childhood, you know, re, re, and know how they're growing, you know, is their stuff, their collection of stuff. Well, the, the hard part about this is that some kids are really dramatically affected, you know, from the origins of this art competition. Um, some kids can be dramatically affected by war, by government, by um, natural disasters, just so many different things can happen to them and they lose their stuff. They can lose their families, you know? 
which yeah. is really just a, oh my goodness, such a thing to think about. Um, so what Ben did was he thought it might be a great idea for other students, other people um, who might have an art bend, might, you know, be adventurous to create some portraits of these kids so that the kids would know somebody's thinking about them oh. for that moment or two. And what he does is he sends you as a, as a you can do this as a class, you can do this individually. Um, he sends you photographs of the children with their age, their name, their age, and maybe their favorite color. Oh, wow. And that's kind of what you get. It's not um, a situation where we have the opportunity to correspond with them continuously because they might not be at that hospital. They might not be at that children's home. They might not be at that school tomorrow. Wow. You know? So the memory project yields portraits like that, which is a very fun thing. Yeah. It's very beautiful. fulfilling. It's beautiful. And it really has so much meaning. I just, I love the way the child looked. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, it was a very fun piece. I've uh, done these for years with my um, not just middle school students when I was at Chester Academy, but at Trinity High School um, for a good 11 years. We did that almost every year, sometimes several times a year. And it's tremendous. It's a tremendous exercise in compassion mm -hmm. and empathy and um learning about other parts of the world because these kids, the photos come from all over. Pick a country. Chances are we've done, you know, photos of. That's great. Well, here's another one of your works. Oh, this is the purple dahlia. I enjoy doing macros of flowers, of photographs. It's sort of a decompressed thing for me. Uh -huh. And the Fuller Gardens up in Rye, New Hampshire, along the beach, um, has a wonderful dahlia collection, a oh, wow. dahlia garden that's out after you go get past the main entrance with all the rose bushes that are all beautiful. Um, there's a dahlia garden that's in between the greenhouses. And this was from one of them. There's, I didn't even realize it was a dahlia, but yes, of course. You're so close to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, neat thing to do in flower gardens is if you are comfortable with your phone, putting it on video and if you can stretch your arm out enough, you can run your photo, pretend you're a bee, and just kind of run your, your phone through among the flowers. And it's a great thing to do uh. <laughs> with flowers that stand up for you, you know, so, you know, one of, one of those. I wish I had thought of that last year. My husband and I were in Amsterdam and we were mm -hmm. visiting the tulips. We went in the spring when it was the mm -hmm. high tulip season. Oh my gosh. I never realized how many tulips and different types of tulips. <laughs> that would be beautiful. That yeah. would. Yeah. We have some tulip farms that are in Southern New Hampshire and Northern Massachusetts. As yes. a matter of fact. So that might be a good thing to remember. Put it on your calendar. <laughs> to go hit the tulip farms when springtime comes around. Oh. Well, here's a different type of flower. And this is from the Sunflower Festival in Concord this past, um, was it August, beginning of September? Um, at that particular, I'm trying to think, I think it's Sun Fox Farm. I would have to look it up because it's just escaping my brain right now. But the field, you can walk right through the middle of the field. They've got paths kind of etched out with everything. So when you go up for the festival, it's really quite fun. It's not just this moment where you get to kind of look at all the blossoms, you know, on your own. But there are thousands of people that go to this and they're all taking photos, too. So you get to look at each other's work and exchange information about it and kind of figure out, you know, what would you like to do? I decided that I was going to do a series that's all black and white. And some of it is more of a cool black and white. Some of it's a little warmer, but check out all these little hairs that are on that thing. That's like crazy when you look at it really close up. 
you know, so just really fun stuff. All the detail that goes on in there. Yeah, I was thinking it was frosted at first, but it's not. No, 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 not yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you can definitely see a lot more of the detail in the black and white. Was that why you chose black and white? Or I think so. I think that's right, Tom. You do. What happens with black and white photography, black and white images, is that your brain slows down. Your huh. brain physically slows down a little bit to spend a little more time to look at it and figure out what it is. It's as simple as that. Huh. Um, because we are so used to seeing in some degree of color that when presented with a black and white image, it's like, huh. Huh. What is all that? And because of contrast, principles of design like contrast, um, proportion, depending upon where you move with your with your composition, where you move with your photograph, you can pick up some really cool stuff. Oh. Really neat things. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't realized that we don't take everything in. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That right brain, left brain kind of thing that goes on which side kicks in the analytical side your left side kicks in to figure out what it is that you're seeing yeah and here's mm -hmm. another black and white yeah this is one of my personal favorites i have the original of this in um my kitchen oh. but it's a photograph and you just play with it and edit it and move around it shows you what can happen with filters where you can increase contrast and play around basically with grain to see oh. what you can do. I love seeing the bees in there. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure I loved being there as well. Yep. Yeah. So do you prefer working in black and white or is it just one of your many palettes? <laughs> it was it was kind, very kind of you. Oh, um you it, I, I think I think I'm I have an eye for it sometimes. Just it just kind of depends on what it's it's a post production thing when you come and sit down and take a look at photos and look at just what might work as a black and white. Sure. What's the effect that you want? You know. Okay. It's good to see them side by side too. Yeah. What what happens with them. Well, here's one where you put in more color. Okay, this is a pastel. Sometimes they're referred to as paintings, soft pastel painting. Um, this is called the Birches, and this is the signature piece for um, an exhibit entitled "The Road Not Taken: Artistic oh, Interpretations yeah. of the Poetry of Robert Frost." So this travels um, along with close to anywhere from twelve to forty pieces of artwork um, completed by myself. Um, originated by Corrine Dodge and Inga Seaboyer, who are from out of Derry, New Hampshire. And the point was to, the challenge was to try and create some pieces or find some pieces in our own bodies of work that reflected themes um, presented by Robert Frost poetry. So this is the one, the signature one that goes along with stopping by woods on a snowy evening. And then Inga has one that is her interpretation. Um, Kareen has one that is her interpretation. And the exhibit features different angles, different ways of looking at things. Oh, very, it's fun. It's good to be, like I said, it, it's good to be busy. It's good to um, connect people with artwork. Sure. All kinds of stuff. Oh, this was so much fun. Um, when I, the first couple of years, um, that I taught high school art, I really wanted to take the kids out. It seems, oh, sometimes you live in an area, but you never get to see what's actually there. And New England has the benefit of, you can, you can get there from here. You can get on the highway and, you know, put some kids in a bus, get on the highway and, and go somewhere. So we went to the Portland Museum of Art in Maine. Oh, nice. And this piece is there. I apologize sincerely. I do not remember what the piece is called. But this young lady just found this so fascinating. And I found it extra fascinating because she just blended right in 
yeah. to the area. So um, this is Nikki Pitt, and um, she's long since graduated from Trinity High School. But, uh, yep, she was always up for posing in front of something or noticing that I've taken a picture of her in front of something and going, oh, me, you know. So the whole idea of edges, of corners, of pieces at that point in a teenager's life um could go along with their personalities you know they can be pretty prickly sometimes but um it was a fun piece to do let's see this this is a study of an aloe vera plant that sometime i'll show you the the thing now um when i first bought it several years ago i was kind of following its growth and it was maybe five inches tall mm. and in about oh the space of maybe two and a half years it's now about two feet tall and about two feet wide and i just decided to start doing paintings of it and this is one uh i also liked how this little if you look in the center <laughs> like i'm looking like you're there. um if you you look in the center there's almost like a person yeah sort of conducting yeah. things yeah Okay. So this is called Allo. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like it. I like the different greens and the texture. I mean, I Thank love you. there, but you just you bring things to life, Judy. It's very nice. It's I it's play. It's very, very fun. It's very fun. And like here's a goofy one. Oh, there's Amelia. This is me. Did you look at her closely? Yes. Did you see her aviator hat? Her yes, hat with the goggles and her little goggles, and she's pointing her little her little wing tip up to test for the wind. Mm. Oh. So this is from this particular spot is going around the curves around the cliff curves of Rye and going up toward um, Odeon Point up that way. Yes. And um, yeah, you can just pull your car right up to the edge of the rocks and look out over and. That's it. So the gulls are brazen. New Hampshire gulls are very um, bold. They're yeah. Bold. I mean, it's their land. What the heck are we doing here? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So she is the first of a series. Um, there are pieces that reflect on, you know, the appearance of a white feather. John Lennon had um, an affinity for white feathers, meaning there's an angel, there's something, you know, kind of coming along with that feather. And um, so in looking for those, sometimes you end up finding the gulls are following you, walking with you. They will literally be a foot away from you as you're walking along. So I thought, okay, fine, I'm just going to take your photograph. And um, yeah, so there's there's the, the photo of a gull that has little lighter bluish green sunglasses on and chasing after feather there's some other things that um let's see i love the rock and the water break. i can do this so oh, oh, this little guy, oh it's still wet but this was last night's effort was doing something with gulls that are flinging themselves all over the place <laughs> and um the wind and the waves and everything so yeah you know, it's it's good to be, if you have thoughts, if you have creative thoughts, and you don't even think about them as creative thoughts, but you just have an image in your head and you want to write about it, you want to sing about it, you want to make music about it, you want to make food that, excuse me, that reflects that thing, you know, do art, do it. Yeah. Not that much time, you know, really. And when you start counting years, depends on whether you're counting up or counting down, you know, you may as well do these things. Yeah, well, why not? Why not? Yeah. This is the inside of a softball. Oh. And it was done as an exercise to connect athletes with art. Oh, when, really? hmm? That's when, Yeah. When you... Um, find yourself in a position of being in charge of a classroom. You're not just disseminating information, but you are helping young people to grow into right. the young adults that they think they are. 
<laughs> and sometimes you just have to meet them. You know, most times you have to meet them where they are. So if you have a classroom full of athletes, none of whom are interested, not even one iota in what you have to say or do, um, you maybe change your subject matter a little bit. Maybe you introduce it through um, the equipment that they use, the environments in which they play. You know, some artist, some designer had to create their uniform. Somebody had to create that basketball somewhere or that softball or that baseball. So yeah. um, kind of have at it that way and let them take things apart and see. Now, not all softballs look like that. Some are very gritty, like a baseball, you know, kind of gritty and stringy and different, you know, hard center and all that. But um, that one we think was a newer model and it had like little almost quilted things and had to score. Huh. Yeah, it definitely reminded me of quilting. <laughs> I love this. Oh, like I said, people um, influenced by my family. Um, my son sent me flowers <laughs> in my classroom for um, my pre-birthday. I mean, my birthday always falls on a holiday that no one's ever in school it's a winter thing and um they sent me some flowers it was a victorian floral bouquet very vintage looking and we just let them dry let them just kind of lay there and dry and then use them as photographic subjects for my photography class my digital art and digital photography class and this is one of my pieces of it someday it's going to grow up and be a full-out painting is that what your photographs grow up to be? <laughs> <laughs> they grow up to be something else. Either either they're a, a much better photograph or a piece of something. Yeah, it's, people have written songs and poetry and novels about photographs. Why not just mm -hmm. have art? Yeah. Photos, you know? Yeah. It's Nothing profound about it. It just is. <laughs> well, but... That is profound, right? The simplest things are profound. And we forget and take things for granted that well, are really just lucky, just lucky to be able to continue to do this. So oh. I think we have one more of your beautiful works here. Mm. That's also from the Sunflower Festival. And this one is called Debutante because she's a very young sun sunflower, very young sunflower. Um, you know, seeds are just kind of growing. Look at that spiral in the center. That just absolutely amazes me. Mm -hmm. And the only little extra effect might be a little, um, a little bit of darkening of edges. Uh -huh. That's that's pretty much it. The um, color version is really quite nice too. But like I said, there was I decided to do a black and white series. Oh. Well, yeah. Thanks for putting that one in. Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, there's so much there's so much depth and diversity in your work. I really love it. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. What's out there for people to just make them think a little bit or make them look a little bit more? You know, I've always told my kids, you know, you, we did so many different things with them. It's like, be aware of the world around you. Yeah. Be aware of, that. Be aware of the fact that there are people in the Drake area who are helping to have other people see better, to feel better, to hear better by the work that you all do. So... I mean, Drake at Arts says it's a pretty important thing you're doing there, Diane and Tom well, and Tom <laughs> and all the other Gary and all the, the other, other Tom. It yeah. is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Judy. Thank you. You too. You too. Please join us on January 24th for Judy's beautiful art gallery. We have many. <laughs> we have. Um. I want to thank our donors first, and then I'll go back to telling you everything about it. Um, there's a 
we cannot do these programs without all of our generous donors. We really want to thank them very much for doing that. If you'd like to be a donor or receive more information about our Arts Saturdays and other programs, please email us at drakeatarts at gmail.com or visit our website at drakeatarts.com. This and all our programs are archived on youtube.com slash at Drake at Arts. Thank you so much for being with us.